uh, welcome one and all, Jim Simpson, convener, climate with us to Five Dock. Welcome back again, some old faces and some new faces. Welcome. Uh, and a special welcome to uh, a couple of uh, guests, especially Jennifer Marahassi. Welcome down from Queensland. Jennifer. Uh, also, where's Ivan? Ivan Kennedy, Emeritus Professor at Sydney University. Been with us before. Welcome back again, Ivan. It's good to see you. And, uh, and Peter Spencer, yes, uh, from uh, from a sick bed, indeed. Welcome, Peter. It's good to see you all along. Uh, I hope uh, Mike's up will join us shortly. Uh, this evening we have a, a rather a special event. Uh, the closest I've ever been to a volcano was uh, a passing one in New Zealand uh, on a holiday and another one over in Maui when I drove to the top of a big mountain there and I couldn't believe the size of it. So I know not a great deal about volcanoes, uh, Wes. But we're going to learn a bit more this evening uh, because Wes Nim, who is uh, a now retired professor from uh, the Chinese University in Hong Kong with uh, the Department of Earth Sciences uh, with, uh, and, and an honorary advisor, Association for Geo Conservation in Hong Kong, past Deputy Chairman, Climate Change Science Implementation Team, for UNESCO, International Year of, of the Planet, is uh, going to talk to us uh, very shortly for perhaps 45 minutes. I'd ask if you could leave question and answers toward the end. I might mention now that uh, most will know I try and put on a, an event of this nature perhaps every three months. The, uh, the next likely guest speaker will probably be early in April and very likely be David Archibald. Oh. Okay. And on that, oh, there is one mention, there is one other special mention I have, and this is, I guess, is for, for Wiss. It's, a, it's an apology from Professor Ian Plymer, who would like to have been here this evening. Uh, his words are, I would love to come, but I have to be elsewhere. I've read Wiss's writings and spent time with him in Hong Kong. He is on to a major driver of weather and climate. His work on El Nino and Arctic eruptions is on the money. On that happy note, Wiss, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm in my retirement and I'm working on the subject that I knew long, long time ago before I retire. It's very exciting because of the satellite age. We can look at volcanic eruptions in a way that we could never have done with earlier eruptions. Now satellite records are available basically since the 1980s. And since the early year 2000s, we have Argo, a network of data boys in the oceans, almost 4,000 of them measuring temperature in the oceanic water down to depths of 2,000 meters. And that's a major advancement in terms of detecting submarine volcanic eruptions. Why they are important, I hope you see from this presentation. Now this presentation is, I've joined actually an international project, past global change project, called VIX, V-I-C-S, Volcanic Impacts on Climate and Society. And they are really at the frontiers. They are trying to give IPCC and other bodies modeling information. The plan of my talk is outlined here. Why ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation or El Nino it's just weather, based on our definition. And something about volcanic eruptions. And I'm going to talk about this long-lasting ENSO from 2014 to 2016, including the impact on Arctic sea ice, which surprised a lot of people. Then I'll come and draw up some conclusions. 
I think I have to start with the definition to refresh people's memory, what the United Nations are up to. The first definition, the UK, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, assumes that we can clearly distinguish what is due to human action. And it's actually not quite true. <laughs> And then the IPCC, which has a much more scientific definition, including the use of statistics, they talk about decades. Again, that has changed because of the pauses in temperature rise. They now call everything, including weather, climate change. But I think we have to give them a kick on this. As an Earth system scientist, I think this is to refresh people's memory that we are interested in the air, the frozen earth, the, which is the cryosphere, and the oceans, the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the soil, and the lithosphere, which is very important, especially including the volcanoes both on land and under the oceans. I think climate change, a definition that as an earth scientist I will accept is something like a product of astronomical forcing, including solar variability and the interactions of the components. But what is the order of importance? I think the first order is hard to dispute if, for myself. Astronomical forcing and the sun is responsible for glacial interglacial cycles, the monsoons and seasons. And second order, not so well known, is the geothermal heat, the heat from the earth, from volcanoes, from magma. And third order are the human-induced changes, including heat generation, water cycle changes, and emission of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. So, but now, what the UN is telling us is number three is going to be number one. Yeah. <laughs> I always show this slide to cover myself. Is there such a thing as global climatic change? I think the uh, honest answer is no. And this slide shows in different parts of the world we have different regional variability. In the Arctic, in different regions of the world, in the Atlantic we have the NAO, uh, in the tropics the MJO, QBO, I don't know whether you're familiar with these names, but they're all important to meteorology. And one of the key, which I have left out, is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. So all these things are important. And basically, these are regional pressure change which could have been triggered by volcanic eruptions depending on where they occur. So it tips the balance in different parts of the world. Okay, my subject today is ENSO, so the proper name El Nino Southern Oscillation. It's important to note that pre-industrial revolution it already existed, so it's not something new not due to rising levels of CO2. And this we can see in coral archives. I actually spent a sabbatical at the Australian National University working on corals. And we can get wonderful records. We can have weekly re resolution or even better. We can work out rainfall before Captain Cook arrived in Australia using these coral archives. Right. And here you can see the record from 1876 to 2017. So we can see the ENSO has occurred quite frequently, usually about seven to eight year cycles. But the 2014 to 2016 ENSO is long lasting and it was strong. <coughs> it was almost as strong as 1997-1998. So ENSO conditions are summarized here. The normal conditions is shown on the left, so, so on your right. Uh, yes, on, sorry, on your left. <laughs> I got it all wrong. So you have upwelling 
off the coast of Peru, South America. And then on the on my left is the Enso condition. So the warm water replaces it because the surface water is going eastward towards the South American continent. But why ENSOs occur in the Pacific? I think it's very important to understand that most of the volcanoes actually occurs in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's important to note that volcanism within the ocean basins, this is the footnote of this slide, currently comprises 70% of the Earth's magma output. <coughs> That's where the geothermal heat is stored. And I think the Pacific Ocean, being the biggest, would occupy at least 60% of the heat source from oceans. It's the biggest ocean. And you can see the black dots, which are the locations of the major volcanoes. Classification of volcanic eruptions are given here. They're divided into three main types, subaerial or terrestrial on land volcanoes. They switch on hot air at the initial stage, followed by cooling, atmospheric warming, injection of ash, gases, and aerosols, blockage of short wave radiation, cloud formation, pressure changes, moisture redistribution, continental cooling, ozone depletion, the circulation change, both air circulation or even ocean circulation changes, and severe weather events may be related to it. Submarine eruptions switches on hot sea water, and often this is mistaken for carbon dioxide storing heat in the ocean. But is it really due to carbon dioxide or really due to magma pouring out on the sea floor? But usually, we do not monitor submarine eruptions until they appear as an island newly created, rising above sea level. Uh. Again, they cause sea surface temperature anomalies, pressure changes, circulation changes, moisture redistribution, continental warming, severe weather events, including cyclones. And this is mistaken for global warming often. Hot sea water and I can give you examples of that later onwards. The third type is actually a mixture of the previous two types. So initially it may be submarine eruption rising above sea level to create a new island, and then it becomes terrestrial. So it's a combination of one and two. Not mentioned in this slide is the magma composition. Acidic magma are highly explosive. Usually a lot of gas is released from the eruption, especially sulfur dioxide. While the basaltic eruptions in the center of the Pacific, such as like in Hawaii, they're much hotter, 1,200 degrees Celsius is the typical temperature of the magma. So it can warm the surface sea water, which is less dense, it comes up to the surface. Two simplified model. First, subaerial or terrestrial volcanic model. If we look on, on my right, right hand side, volcanic eruptions are great for forming clouds. Ash and aerosols are released. So initially, you have hot air rising upwards into the sky. So it's initial warming. Then eventually, these particulates, the ash and the aerosols, reduces solar radiation leading to cooling. Warm air stores more moisture and it transports massive amounts of water vapor into the stratosphere if it's a large enough eruption. It causes air pressure to change, hot air is low pressure. And this slide comes from the Mexico volcanic eruption, El Chichong, in 1982. And it's the first eruption cloud that we monitored 
around the world taking 21 days. So that for the first time, we can see tracking of an eruption cloud taking so long to go around the globe. On the other hand, the eruption changes normal air circulation. It creates clouds, so it's a great way of forming clouds, uh, sometimes quite enormous in size. It destroys ozone, and the gases release, the main ones are sulfur dioxide, hydrogen chloride, carbon dioxide, which may be a greenhouse gas, as well as water vapor. So degassing, particularly from acidic eruption, is massive. And cool air stores less moisture, so the cooler air are sucked into the vent area of the volcanic eruption. And if the eruption is a large one, the impact would large, much, last much longer. The scale we use for measuring volcanic eruptions on land is shown here. It's after Newell and Shelf work in 1982. It's based on the tephra, which is the particulates released from the eruption. You can see the pie charts, the circle, the larger the circle, the bigger the eruption. The scale goes from zero to eight, and the biggest eruption in the record is Yellowstone. So there's now reports earlier this year that the magma over the North America area is actually rising. And if we have the next Yellowstone, I think it's really a, a cop a apocalypse event. Maybe we should spend all our effort dealing with CO2 on this next big eruption. I think for the world, we we'll, we'll, we'll may well suffer from it. But if we look back at the last 100 years or so, not even close to Yellowstone. 1991, we have the Pinatubo volcanic eruption. That has a VI of six. Uh, small eruptions with VI two, you can find weather impacts already. So it's not uncommon. I can give you some examples of that. Satellite monitoring has improved a great deal. We now have the NASA A train. And the most important one for studying volcanic eruption is this Kelliop, for short. It provides vertical profiles of aerosols in the atmosphere. And we can study this. And very important, people studying aviation safety have to use this record to decide which airport to shut in case the jet engines stall. And that has happened a number of times, as I will outline later on, with over Australia from South American volcanic eruptions. 2010, some of you may remember, transatlantic flights were affected by this Iceland volcanic eruption. I can't pronounce the name, so I just call it E15. That's the way to study volcanic eruptions, I think. It makes it easier. 15 letters after the letter E. Now this is actually tracking of the clouds, so you can see the brownish area is the volcanic clouds. The reason I studied the present day is because of the better record. It's getting closer to empirical. We look back at the records of past eruptions and put them together. I don't do any predictions. And this is very important. For example, one of the impact of this 2010 eruption, a country in Central Europe, Slovakia, had the heaviest rainfall since 1881 for that year. And it's all because of the eruption cloud track, which I'll show later onwards. We have the best meteorological observations. Satellite observations are available since 1980s. And we also have very good media reports of disasters, floods especially. Aviation safety studies, these people deciding where the airports are close. It's the most reliable, info, most reliable record we have because we can track eruption count day by day. And if you can afford it, like in Germany, 
you can actually send airplanes up to collect air samples straight away, like in uh, Max Planck I Institutes. It's also very important in terms of societal relevance to farming, and it may even help climate model testing. Now, this is a map prepared by the US Air Force base in Europe. And it actually shows Iceland at the top and the occluded fronts, one after another, three successive ones, bringing in storm clouds into Central Europe. And this station in Slovakia, Herbanovo, the upper graph is the temperature and the blue graph is the rainfall. You can see it skyrocketed in 2010 for that year. It's the wettest year on record, all because of the cyclone tracks. So it's a regional change, and it doesn't apply to the whole of Europe. And similarly, this brought moisture deep into the continental interior of Europe. Without the volcanic eruptions, it wouldn't have done it. Right? For submarine volcanic eruptions, we don't have that many to study in the last 20 years, but I've studied three. The first one is Canary Islands. This is an eruption. The pictures of El Hero, one of the islands in the Canary Archipelago. It lasted six months from October 2011 to March 2012, relatively long. I've studied a shorter eruption of Tonga, not so far from here, that lasted just about one month, from December 2014 to January 2015, in the peak of the Southern Hemisphere summer, and that is very important. More interesting is this longer eruption that lasted two and a half years. It has escaped mentioning by many people, Nishinoshima, 940 kilometers south of Tokyo, and that lasted for two and a half years. And I'm going to talk about these. The possible effects of submarine eruptions are heating up of the seawater, pressure changes, surface wind changes, sea level changes, ocean current changes, even polar sea ice changes, as I will show in the case of the Arctic Ocean later onwards. For basaltic eruptions, the lava is 1,200 degrees Celsius, so it causes warming, the opposite of terrestrial eruption. So volcanic eruptions are a mechanical, is a mechanism of both warming and cooling. And the warming part is not well known in the community because they haven't studied submarine volcanic eruptions. The Argo data boys now in operation has 4,000 points in the oceans managed by all these different countries listed, so they are actually funding it. So we have a float system down to 2,000 meters water depth measuring temperature, salinity, and current velocity. So this is an added new information since the early 2000s for us to spot the first submarine volcanic eruption sending hot seawater to the surface of the oceans. And we can look at the sea surface temperature anomaly maps of NOAA. So both resources are free of charge, and this is what I make use of for my study. Okay, a little bit about where I come from, Hong Kong, our temperature record which is very similar to the global temperature record. <clears throat> and the reason is quite simple. The urban heat island effect has not been totally removed from the global temperature record. I think it's well known. Right. We started measuring temperature in Hong Kong in 1884, the year after Krakatoa, 1883. And 1884 was the lowest temperature we ever had 
lowest annual mean temperature, 21.3 degrees Celsius. This information has now been removed from the Hong Kong Observatory web station because two months they don't have complete records, so they have taken it away. They used to list this. But 2015 in Hong Kong turned out to be the hottest year on record. So if you join to 1884 to 2015, you're bound to have a temperature record going up. But we now know 2015, like 1998, they were strong ENSO years. It's an anomaly due to ENSO. Nothing to do with warming. We have these major pauses in temperature rise, 18, 1998 to 2015, about 17 years, then a much longer pause from 1966 to 1998. It's these pauses that cause the United Nations to change weather to climate change. Mm -hmm. So just to fool the public. Now this station is the Hong Kong Observatory Headquarters Station. And for those people who have been to Hong Kong, that's near to Nathan Road on the Kowloon Peninsula. And it's a basin, the Victoria Harbour Basin, so it's a heat trap. Uh, comparisons that has been done by former staff of the Hong Kong Observatory with Macau. Macau's observatory is on the top of a hill for the record of comparison, it doesn't show any temperature rise in Macau over almost 100 years. But in the Hong Kong Observatory Headquarters Station, it shows a rise of 0 0.9 degrees Celsius. So this slope that we are looking at. Right. So they reckon that the mean rate is 0 0.13 degrees Celsius per decade. But this is without removing urban heat island. I think this is the problem. And this is one out of 50 stations in Hong Kong. <coughs> right. We have rural stations that shows totally different trends. I've also been looking at rainfall, I think just to highlight the role in controlling rainfall. These are identified causes in Hong Kong rainfall. 1963 was our driest year on record an Egong on Bali, Indonesia, erupted that year, causing the wind circulation change in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is located at the margin of the biggest continent in the world, Asia. If you have offshore wind, it's a drought year, predominantly. If you have onshore wind, predominantly, you have a lot more moisture. Like in 1982, when the Mexico volcano erupted, it traveled all the way from East Pacific across the Pacific Ocean and reached South China Sea. And almost instantaneously, once the eruption cloud was over the sky of Hong Kong, we started to have heavy rain <coughs> for much of that year. It's the second wettest year on record. Pinatubo in 1991, eruption date was middle of June. Already five and a half months was passed, and you have a second eruption also just as big in South America, Cerro Hudson. So you have double whammy. And it turned out to be the 11th driest year on record in Hong Kong. A South American eruption in 2008, which I'm going to talk about later on, was that also affected Australia, Chai Tan in Chile, led to the sixth wettest year in Hong Kong. And this was the eruption in early May 2008. A very strong ENSO year causing the wettest year on record is 1997. So ENSO years can be extremely wet, but not from 2014 to 2016. So every ENSO is actually different. So there's no generalization. This is a satellite image of Pinatubo over Luzon, which is the big island of the Philippines. You can see the white cloud and then the eruption cloud highlighted in blue here. So this is only about a few hours after the eruption. 
So there was an enormous typhoon cloud already over Luzon, enormous amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. Right? And based on our study of this, we believe that it would lead to a global drought year in terms of water vapor transfer into the stratosphere. The maximum cloud height was 55 kilometers. So it's much, much higher than the typhoon cloud, which is normally about 12 kilometers. And this led to jet stream transport of the ice crystals. So the larger ice crystals are transported shorter distances. And the larger and the finest ice crystals are transported much further afield by the jet stream and can circle the globe, seedling the clouds, causing precipitation. Some of you may have heard of atmospheric rivers. They were recognized in the 1990s for the first time. And there's a number of them due to the polar vortex dragging southwards bringing enormous amount of moisture into unusual places. This is a summary slide. I don't have time to show you many slides, so I thought I'd just summarize in words what it amounts to. After the Chai Ten eruption of 2nd of May, which is in autumn in the Southern Hemisphere, this is quite important because it enables it to cross the equator, the ITCC, which is the difficult part. Uh, tracking by satellites, we can identify a very wet May and June in South Africa after it has crossed the South Atlantic. Then it crosses the Indian Ocean, Australia, including the continental interiors, causing flood of tourists to watch the desert flowers blooming after the heavy rain. I think this is also happening this year after the floods in Queensland. I think. Record rainfall in Western Tasmania where they use hydroelectric power and I can show you the letter I wrote to the newspaper later. The wettest June in Hong Kong since record began in 1884. So the amount of rainfall we have was 346.8% above average. And we reckon the rainstorm we had, which is a one in 1,100 year event, on the island where our airport is located, it triggered 2,400 landslide, a single rainstorm. And that's unheard of. So this was the area, Lantau Island, where the heaviest rainfall occurred and some of the landslides that we have. 2,400 of them, single rainstorm. So this is from the Bureau of Meteorology. The average rainfall over 30 years in June, and then compared to June in 2008, drastically different. So this is all the result of aerosols, water vapor transfer into the stratosphere. The VEI is five, so it penetrated the stratosphere. The height of the cloud is about 22 kilometers above sea level. Now, you may ask, what is the supporting evidence of the transfer? So I've again summarized it here. The eruption timing was favorable. It's during the Southern Hemisphere autumn. So the sun is migrating northwards from the Tropic of Capricorn to the Tropic of Cancer. So this helped the aerosols to be able to cross the ITCC. The eruption cloud height is over 21 kilometers, penetrating the stratosphere. And in fact, the satellite Kaliop tracking of the aerosols de was detectable the sulfur dioxide content was high enough to be measured over Southeast Australia. And this is why they make the decision to close some of the airports. Right. So this is only about 12 days after the eruption. Volcanic debris also impacted Hong Kong in the right direction, southwest monsoon. The wind is coming from the southwest. So it fits in with the aerosols coming across the equator second time round the globe, not the first time. 
And this is the remarkable thing. We published a chapter in the book on this, on the tracking. But most important is the last item, e folding time. E folding time is, I think, the best way to look at this is the half life of sulfur dioxide. How long it takes for the sulfur dioxide to be oxidized into sulfuric acid. Based on the study of Pinatubo, other scientific workers did the work. They reckon 35 days is the magic number. And this is exactly what we have in the case of Chai Tan. On the 7th of June, you remember the eruption was 2nd of May, roughly 35 days again. Magic number coming up. So if you want to look at volcanic impact on rainfall, you look for this e-folding time, the magic number. Then for the rest of the year, rainfall will still be above normal. Right. But rainfall, I can tell you, is one of the major challenges for meteorologists to predict. Uh, but here we have a case of volcanoes because of the tracks can affect rainfall. So just to prove another case example, this is 2011, another volcanic eruption in Chile. If you cannot pronounce it, just call it P6 again. So uh, that's what I've done, P6. Right? And this is comparison of the July rainfall. The average rainfall in July is compared to July 2011. Drastically different. Right? So probably the aerosols went further south. So northern part of Australia is not uh, so much affected by the aerosol. But you can see this, right? It's, and you can use satellite tracking to track the aerosols. It also disrupted flights in Melbourne, Tasmania and New Zealand for eight to nine days, which is quite a long time period without international flights. When I was invited to go back to Tasmania, I saw this headline in the examiner Rainfall, a windfall project for hydro. And they did ask, have your say, what do you think of hydro's profit? So I immediately saw the article and I wrote a letter in and it was published the next day, the hydro windfall. Hydro should perhaps thank volcanic eruptions for the windfall. On May, actually the 2nd, 2008, and June 4th, 2011, two volcanoes located in Chile erupted. The heavier rainfall is likely to have been caused by the spread of the volcanic clouds. In other words, the above normal rainfall was caused by natural variability and has nothing to do with carbon dioxide emissions by anthropogenic activity. We see in Hong Kong. It's good that they publish things like that. They don't insist on removing this carbon dioxide sentence. In Hong Kong, they do. <laughs> okay. Now, let's look at the ENSO now, so the serious stuff, 2014 to 2016. What I've done here in this table listed the volcanic eruptions uh, in 2012 to 2016, which may have played a part. Uh, the first one may have played only a very minor part, and it's an eruption not well known even in Australia. It was discovered by someone in Hobart, uh, Dr. Carey, uh, the University of Tasmania, incidentally, where I did my PhD. <laughs> and they had a conference on submarine volcanism there in January last year. Cutting edge stuff on submarine volcanoes. But they are really stole in pinpointing the role in climate change. I've looked at the proceedings Basically, I was planning to go to that meeting out of my pocket, but I couldn't go at the end. To highlight, we should study submarine volcan volcanoes. But no one went, so that's why nothing much happened. But this report of a volcano north of New Zealand, Havre, H-A-V-R-E, north of Auckland, is supposed to be the largest deep ocean silicic eruption in the past century. And it resulted in a pumice fragment, 4,000 square kilometers in size, floating to the surface of the Pacific. And this was recognized by satellites. The pilot who discovered it 
was on a flight from Auckland to Samoa, and he took pictures of it, and he sent the photos to someone, an academic in Queensland University of Technology. And then they follow up with satellite image, and then local study, and identify this pumice. A lot of the pumice eventually get waterlogged and sunk to the bed, back into the bottom of the sea. But some become transported by waves onto your beaches. Uh, so this is not so far from the Tonga volcano. It's silicic, so it is extremely rich in gas. So it's a more acidic composition magma. So it's not as hot as the bas bas basaltic magma, but there's a lot of degassing, contributing major amounts of sulfur dioxide into the Southwest Pacific Ocean. And this may have led to acidic Fication of the oceans on a massive scale, which no one is looking at. Right. Okay, the next eruption is Nishinoshima, south of Tokyo. This eruption was initially submarine. The first report that we know a submarine eruption has taken place was when a new island appeared, and that was in November 2013. I've gone back to look at NOAA sea surface temperature and I found that the earliest warning of hot sea water was March six months earlier, at least six months earlier, 2013. So the eruption lasted two and a half years and it created massive changes in the North Pacific Ocean, a phenomenon called the North Pacific Blob that I will say something about. In December 2014, we have off Tonga, Hunga Volcano. So this is, I think if you Google all this, you can find lots of wonderful images of this eruption. Initially, it was submarine until a new island was created, but it all happened within one month, very fast. And then in 2015, in May to June, very critical, Galapagos, which belongs to Ecuador, a volcano called Woof erupted with basaltic lavas. This is a terrestrial eruption, hot lava flows entering the Pacific Ocean. I think this is the final straw of the strong Enzo. It's warming of the seawater at the right location because of Galapagos. Another eruption that may have a minor role is Kilauea, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Hot lava flows into the Pacific Ocean. But if it is long-lasting and large enough, it may have contributed to the Enzo also. Okay. Okay, Hefray. Kamadok Arc. So this is a volcanic ridge north of New Zealand all the way to Tonga. The location of Hefray is there. And this is the image identifying the pumice piece. I think you can just about see it with the yellow pointer. There are all together 14 vents, so it's all spread out. I, I think some of the vent locations are shown here. So it's a massive crater. The water depth is relatively deep, 900 to 1,220 meters. And Kerry has a paper documenting this. I actually tried to look for indications of warming of the oceans. I find some evidence, but not so good. And my conclusion is that it doesn't contribute to major warming of the ocean water because of the water depth, maybe, and because of the composition, silicic. Okay, Nishinoshima, in November, a new island appeared south of Tokyo, 940 kilometers. Then it started to grow. There are hot lava flows entering the ocean, so forming a separate island, larger and larger. So these are images from, Na from NASA. The eruption ceased in August 2015. Now these maps, anyone can download. It's, they are all from NOAA. Sea surface temperature anomaly maps. So this is what I do. I don't have any funding, but all I do is look at these images at the right time frame. So this is 
what I claim to be the main trigger of the 2014-2016 ENSO, the sea surface temperature anomalies created the North Pacific blob, which is this large circular patch of warmer than normal seawater, even hotter than near the equatorial region, 2.5 degrees Celsius higher than normal. So what is called the North Pacific blob. So the colors, red is actually the highest, orange is intermediate, and then yellow, and then the darker colors, uh, the lower temperatures. Nishinoshima is located here by the red triangle. So two and a half years eruption. It has done something to the format, I think. I'm s it looked okay, I think, on my computer screen, but not here now. This is supposed to be a summary of the events. I, I think this PowerPoint can be downloaded by anyone. I don't think it's any secret. I will also upload it on ResearchGate so you can look at it properly without the distortion. And basically, it listed the sequential events reported by different people. The Japanese Coast Guard has been measuring, monitoring the growth of the island as it erupted over the two and a half years period. The name, the blob, was given by an oceanographer from the University of Washington. And they had this two years without winter in 2014 to 2015, uh, with major changes in biodiversity. I think, I think we better look at the next Im I I image since I cannot show you the sequential events. Now what must have happened, the normal circulation pattern is shown in the gyres that I've shown on the bottom diagram. The normal current operating on the Northwest Pacific is a Kuroshu. It goes off the coast of Luzon towards Taiwan and then the coast of Japan and then towards Alaska. Nishinoshima is located on a volcanic ridge just here. Already the ridge is a sort of obstacle for the Kuroshu. But if you have an eruption taking place, submarine, it acts as an even greater barrier to the normal circulation of a Kuroshu. Now you have even hotter water here than near the equator. So basically, you have a slowdown of the Kuroshu. And this is why funny things happen. And the weather pattern started to change in the North Pacific. So this is September. About nine months have passed since the first image. The hot water patch, the blob patch, has already split into three smaller patches, one off the coast of Alaska one off the coast of Seattle and one off the coast of California. And basically, this is warm water building up in the slack areas of the gyres. So because of the Coriolis, the rotational impact on the surface seawater, which is hotter. Hotter seawater is always less dense, so it goes to the surface. Because the North Pacific is warmer, what will it do to the Antarctic sea ice? the cooler water will tend to migrate, move, they get to be stimulated to move northwards to neutralize this warmer water. So there's actually sea ice expansion in this part of the South Pole. In terms of weather pattern, you see we can also explain that. Often the North Pacific block, we have what is called the three hours ridiculously resilient ridge. It's ridiculous because no one can explain it, basically. It's a high pressure ridge existing there for almost two years. 2014, 2015, two years with extraordinary mild winters. But yet in central North America, we have lots of rain and heavy snow. And that's explained by the polar vortex swinging southwards. Uh, and also in Western Europe's times of the year, you also have snow. But basically, the high and low pressure is distinguished. The high pressure ridge formed by the three hours, ridiculously resilient ridge. 
and then the low pressure, which is the po polar vortex. Now, National Geographic had a feature on this. Uh, September 2016 issue, all these photos come from there. They talk about this as, as it's the future of global warming. So mass mortality in terms of red crabs, uh, eels, shrimps, otters, and the sunfish can be subtropical species can be seen off the coast of Alaska. But you cannot fool the sperm whales. They are smart. They follow the food. So you can see them off the coast of Monterey. Starvation of sea lion pups, so all the benthic organisms don't have enough food. Uh, so jellyfish washed up, and you can see squids off the coast of Alaska because of the warmer seawater than normal. Okay, if we look at now at June 2015, getting closer to the peak Enso, I've located the wolf eruption of Cal Galapagos and Hunger, the two volcanoes. Hawaii was actually in 2015 severely affected by coral bleaching, but the good news is it's now fully recovered. <coughs> right. So the wolf eruption may have been the final trigger, and if we look at the eruptions, so these are some of the images that you can see on hunger eruption, the hunger volcano. So that's the submarine eruption location. And it, within a month, it created this new island, very explosive, because it's silicic. And then the natural cause for Great Barrier Reef coral bleaching because of the timing. It's the peak of the Southern Hemisphere summer, December to January. So it's just added on even higher temperature. So the rise in ocean acidity caused by sulfur dioxide, many people have actually missed that. Uh, because some eruptions do release large amounts of sulfur dioxide. The wolf eruption is a terrestrial eruption. So hot lava flows entering the Pacific. At night time, you can also see this. So this is VI4 which is moderate. Right. So the heating up of the seawater. So this is the final straw in terms of the ENSO. But remember, ENSO is normally an event that occurs around Christmas time. But this is August in the summer, Northern Hemisphere summer. So the timing is all different. And we have these Im images to show it. Uh, now what else do we have? We have people reporting based on the Argos network of data boys, comparison between the 1997-1998 ANSO to the 2015-2016. Oh, you can see the thickness of the hottest sea water is enormous compared to the earlier ones. And this may be consistent with Nishinoshima playing a major role, heating up the seawater on a massive scale. This is not my work, but someone else's work. The wonderful things that you can do with satellite imaging. You can have time slices comparing 1997 ANSO to the current one, individual frame, and you can see the impact on the hotter seawater is totally different. So don't think of ENSO as all the same. They are all different. The pattern is all different. And the key is coming up next. Ocean surface topography. The satellites are smart enough to tell you differences in elevation, which supports your conclusions based on observation. So this is a composite for a time period 1999 as compared to 2017. And this satellite's use, even though it has changed to JSON-3 in the new version, can take into account the ocean surface topography differences. 
So the minute differences in sea level because of the pressure change can be detected. Now let's move on to impacts. Arctic sea ice. Arctic sea ice has been monitored since 1979. I'm only talking about the last 10 years that we have stumbled on the best explanation we have for Arctic sea ice variability than anyone has come across. Some of you notice my left hand shakes a little bit. Parkinson's. It's a small world. The expert on Arctic sea ice in NASA is Dr. Parkinson's. <laughs> it's a woman, it's a female, Claire Parkinson. And in fact, I've sent my publications on to her and she likes the ideas that we have a point about the North Pacific blob and so on. Yeah. But however, the organization doesn't allow her to reflect this. I think this is the world. Yeah. Now, basically, what I've shown here, the bottom three diagram is the September sea ice over the three years, 2014 to 2016. And the upper three diagrams are the December sea ice. Why September? Always like clockwork, the sea ice is at a maximum around end of March every year. And then at a minimum in September, after the summer, the Northern Hemisphere summer. So these are the best indication periods. And you can see 2014, 2015, 2016, the mi in millions of square kilometers, you see a gradual decline of Arctic sea ice from 5.03 to 4.14, a relatively gradual decline. But the record low sea ice is earlier, 2012, 3.39. Right. So why is that? I can explain both. Instead of showing you a lot of diagrams to show the sea ice changing every month, I decided to show this. These are the 12 months of the year. So 1979 is on your, on your right hand side, on your left hand side, and 2017 is on the other side. The ranking of Arctic monthly air temperatures during this time period up to 2017. The red colors, number one, the hottest year, They are here in 2016. So the blue are cold. And, ba ba and basically, 2012 is here. 2014, 15, 16 are located here. In terms of air temperature rank by month. But in terms of changes, this is the best summary diagram that I can find. The drastic drop in 2012 was caused by another eruption, in this case the North Atlantic, El Hero, the one I showed in the submarine volcano model. So it's not even an eruption occurring in the Arctic Ocean. It's in the North Atlantic, but because it's closer to the North Pole, it caused the sea ice to shrink much more. While this Enso years, 2014 to 2016, due to Nishinoshima, you have a much more gradual decline, but not to the same drastic extent. Right. Uh, the two bars are for different methods of assessment. The white bar is for the multi-sensor CI's extent. And the SII is just the sea ice extent based on estimation. The other eruption that caused this drastically lower sea ice in 2012 is El Hero of the Canary Archipelago. These are images that I can find. So El Hero Island is just the block of island. Submarine eruption was from 200 meters water depth, a relatively shallow eruption. You can see floating pumice coming all the way to the surface. At times, it actually surfaced to form a small island, but then it disintegrated again. 
and this lasted for six months during the Northern Hemisphere winter. And the impacts are, so this came out, so I'm glad, so I, I can go through this. The weather related events and patterns in the North Atlantic basins during 2012. The UK has severe flooding. I'm sitting in Hong Kong working on these summary eruptions and I can put all these events back into the calendar in the table in different parts of the North Atlantic basins, including major events like Hurricane Sandy, the one that hit New York, major storm surge. Hottest year on record in Virginia, so I think if I could just run, just run through that. Wettest summer for in 100 years, annual rainfall 1,331 millimeters, and severe flooding in England and Wales. Drought estimated damage in Central North America. Arctic sea ice being the lowest on record. I can explain all these things, but no one cares. So it was published in Imperial College Engineer, my former university. But the editor seems to like what I <laughs> published, so I, I bung it in there to save all the trouble. And then you can look at Greenland, extensive period of melting, it was reported in Nature, massive melting in Greenland at the right time in July, Northern Hemisphere summer, just after the submarine eruption has heated up the seawater in the North Atlantic. And also in November, when there was a very wet week. The reason why the oceans were warm, the cyclones were very active, bringing heavy rainfall to the UK, one cyclone after another, causing severe flooding. And then the winter in the US East Coast, abnormally cool and wet due to the polar vortex. And the British Isles also abnormally cold due to the polar vortex. So we can start to put these things together, at least regionally. OK, NOAA has been selling the hottest 10 years on record. I don't have all the explanation. I have some of the explanation. So the hottest year on record they claim is 2016. I think this is at least in part due to the ANSO conditions of the, and the North Pacific blob dissipation. 2015 is ANSO conditions and the North Pacific blob. 2017, the blob has disappeared, so I can't explain it. 2014, ANSO condition in the North Pacific Bloc. At least I have some explanation for some of these years. But whether they have fiddled the data or not, I'm not too sure. Right. But 2013, we have Nishinoshima causing the North Pacific warming from March 2013 to August 2015. And then in 1998, we have this other strong ENSO on record from 1997 to 1998. Right. So that's my explanation. Okay, just before concluding, we have to say something about carbon dioxide. I can't see any connection, so I bung in this slide. I think most of you know this. It's a life-giving gas in plant photosynthesis. Humans generates heat, I think it's very clear in Hong Kong based on my temperature study. We have moved our international airport from Kai Tech to the new location, and the new location is now the hottest place in Hong Kong, especially after sunset, because only the jet engines are heating up the place. It's not the sun. Clouds and water vapor distribution are much more important than carbon dioxide and surface temperature changes. Very clear from volcanic eruptions. Water vapor redistribution, cloud formation. Volcanic eruptions is a wonderful way for forming cloud systems. Climate models cannot explain the two recent temperature pauses and the poor correlation between temperature records and the rising levels of CO2. Terrestrial and submarine volcanic eruptions are underestimated natural causes 
of both cooling and warming. The warming part is still very poorly understood. I read many papers on volcanic eruptions, mostly they are terrestrial eruptions. It can cause cooling mostly, most of the time. Some warming in some parts of the world. 55 to 70 year AMO cycles, Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, climatic cycles may be in operation. And being Chinese, I must flock the Chinese calendar which are based on 60-year cycles. They're actually solar cycles. Uh, I think based on analysis of tide gauges all over the world, people have come to the similar conclusions that AMO cycles seems to fit in. Again, 60-year cycles. If you look at tide gauges, if their record is less than 60 years, maybe you sh will not see anything. You will have to look at a longer time period. But Sydney has Fort Denison, which is a wonderful long record, the longest record we have in the southern hemisphere. And we can look at these cycles. And by comparison with our tide gauge in Hong Kong, I think we can learn a lot. Hong Kong tide gauge is totally useless, I can tell you. It's located on a reclaimed land and it's sinking. <laughs> but you would expect it to sink in the early part of the record, but actually it didn't. Sea level has fallen from 1959 to, 1990, to 1987. We moved the tide gauge to a new reclamation in 1987, and for the period of 12 years, from 1987 to 1999, sea level dramatically increased 29 centimeters. <laughs> no one can explain it, but they use it in IPCC. Oh, well. <laughs> but it's a reclamation. I have corrected this because we also have six other tide gauges in Hong Kong that doesn't show the same pattern. But they only use the tide gauge with the longest record. So, this is why something is wrong. And also, any tide gauge in Hong Kong is influenced by rainfall from the Pearl River. Wet years tend to have lower pressure, sea level is more elevated. Drought years, more depressed because of the high pressure. And this is reflected by seasonal rainfall. So I would stay clear of any tide gauge at major river mouth. If, I, if you ask me. Recently, another group from Chinese University of Hong Kong have studied the same subject, and they've concluded the Hong Kong tide gauge is an anomaly. So in agreement, in full agreement with my conclusions. Right. Okay. Just to draw up some conclusions, based on the strong, based on the study of observation records, the 2014-2016 ENSO was caused by a combination of terrestrial and submarine volcanic eruptions. Atmospheric water vapor and cloud distribution are much more important than carbon dioxide, even though I'm showing the evidence very clearly. Possible contributors to the strong and long-lasting, I think this is important, it's long-lasting. It's different from any previous ENSO. The 2014-2016 ENSO include the Nishinoshima eruption from March 2013 to August 2015, the Hunger eruption from December 2014 to January 2015, and then the Wolf eruption from May to June 2015. And this is actually supported by Arctic sea ice changes. So this is a first, no one has made the link and I've published that in a one-page article in Imperial Engineer. I can send you the PDF if you're interested, basically with my diagram. And this is the one that Claire Parkinson's like. And she's the expert on Arctic sea ice. I've also sent it to Bremer, uh, Gunnar Spleen, who's the remote sensing expert on Arctic sea ice, and he suggested that I should follow up with modeling, which I'm not my, which is not my specialty. I think someone else can do it, maybe. 
the missing heat attributed, I think this is important, this is what the, because of the pauses in temperature rise, the UN, IPCC, they're all coming to this. Missing heat attributed to carbon dioxide storage in oceans may be better explained, I think according to my study, by geothermal heat released through submarine volcanism rather than storage of carbon dioxide. The role of volcanic eruptions in climate change, both cooling and warming, is underestimated. It's part of our dynamic Earth. I think the latest monthly temperature record actually show we have come to the end of the Ansel, and temperature is falling in agreement with the lower sunspots. And my final slide, I think coming up, I think volcanic eruptions is a natural experiment for us to learn from. I think the take home message is to look back and learn from past records. I think this is what I think I have done. Thank you very much. Time not, at, not at all, not at all. It was very good. Please, please stay. Uh, if, uh, if there might be any questions, uh, oh, there's, there's lots of hands going up. <laughs> I know. Based, based on um, your um, explanation there, can you or will you be able to explain the very wet season and the rain that we've had in northern in Queensland? Will that come about as a result of some volcanic action somewhere, do you think? I haven't looked at that event. I tend to go for eruptions in South America. So it's much more reliable because I have done two case studies already. So I'm looking for the next big VEI-5 eruption. But in your case, the sun is always in operation. Don't forget. The sun can also be heating up the oceans to cause your cyclones. So, but I haven't looked at submarine eruptions in this part of the world in the last year. I will have. I may have to go back to do it. If it, if there's any linkage, whether Hefra has been active again, I'm not too sure, because no one is monitoring submarine eruptions at the moment. We have to go and look at the Argo data and look at the NOAA sea surface temperature data to try to track where the hot seawater is located and see whether there's links to a submarine eruption. Thank Someone you. will have to do the work. Thank you. But it's quite exciting. <laughs> uh, Arthur? It's more likely to be weather than CO2. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the other thing though, adding to that, you've got multiple tens of thousands of submarine volcanism happening in the mid-ocean ridges, right? Mid-ocean ridge basalt, 1200 odd degrees, it's happening at depths of super critical pressures. So there's no gas involved. So you've got hot water, super critical CO2, and in solid solution, super critical sulfur, sulfuric acid going into those deep oceans. You're talking about 47,000 kilometers of this volcanism happening constantly. So uh, that has to be factored in as well, doesn't it? I mean, that, that's gonna have a huge input to the, to the ocean chemistry and the ocean temperatures. And that's not even included in the climate models, even vaguely, as a heat, as part of the heat budget. So yeah, that's it's amazing that they don't they don't even look at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean you're you're looking at it. So. I've only said I've only studied three submarine eruptions. Yes, but but I want to do more. But there, there's they you can learn about them. There's an influence of them. Yeah. All right, Jennifer. Just so we capture the question, maybe you, you come come to the front so we can pick up your question on the on the audio. If you may come come forward, I'm not so sure that we're able to pick the audio up uh, since it, since it's, the sound is down here. Yeah. And you're so much more photogenic than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Just following on on the last question, given that there are so many undersea eruptions occurring all the time, how do you perhaps um, rate them and know that one is likely to be more, uh, 
more influential than another, for example, in creating the Super El Nino of 2015-2016. Yeah. We don't have a scale for some reason yeah. of the eruptions at the moment. So, uh, but also, based on what I can find out from Hefri, the summary eruption, the biggest one in the past century, it didn't show hot sea water, which is surprising. I actually look at the record more or less every month, but it's a much deeper water eruption, almost 1,000 meters depth, but it's silicic, which is lower temperature, but it's highly charged with gas, whether the gas is something funny to it. So, so you're going to develop think, an uh, index for us? Uh, I doubt it. I have to look at <laughs> lots more eruption. I think basaltic ones we know are much higher temperature. So hot lava flows into the oceans will cause seawater to be hot. And if the flow of magma is substantial, it can possibly trigger ansels because it's the latitude that counts. But I think, you know, ho hopefully someone will follow this up. There are lots of things to study. I think submarine volcanism is definitely one of those topics very important in climate change. Indeed. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, I, I, I've got a question. I, I, mentioned, I mentioned this ridge. Um, so we can hear the question. I mentioned the ridge off yes. northern Canada. It was called the Gackle Ridge. Gackle. Do you know that at all? No, I'm afraid not. No, well, it was 1999. There should be a plenty on, on the record about it. I wish there were satellites in those days. Then we can study it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this is the key. I think the modern record is so good now. We can look back at these events if we know that they have gone off. Otherwise, I think we wouldn't have known. Uh, not many people have followed this thread, uh, but some universities, I was surprised, Cambridge University, if you type Cambridge Volcanology, there's almost 30 staff members. Wow. So it goes to show they've flooded the market because they want to do all the cutting edge work. I, I can now understand why my university ranking is so slow. <laughs> Be mainly because there's only one person crazy enough to be interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, did you want to raise? Just, just, just come forward so we can hear your question, mate. Right? Comment, right? They, uh, they or comment. Okay. They accuse skeptics of cherry picking data, right? Um, if you if you go back to that temperature graphic you had there, the, the NASA one. Um, there's a group called I think they're called the Copernicus group in, somewhere in Europe, the UN or somebody. They've they've um, the, the, what they've done is quite amazing. They're, for a start, everyone's saying, oh, it's the hottest decade, because if you use any other time frame, it's not the hottest. It has to be the hottest decade, mm. right? And if you go, that second last diagram um, showing the monthly, if you, if you this Copernicus people, they take those data sets and they, they run a five-year moving average through it. And the, the five-year moving average just happens to be the period so that makes the temperature look like it's continuing to go up towards infinity at the end, and it completely wipes out the, the termination of that end. So, Jerry, picking it just goes like that because Jerry. they've taken the five-year moving average and haven't recentered it, and that's disgustingly dishonest. Well, it's, a, it's an abuse of it's it's an abuse of and that's, science. That's the that's a, the latest UN report that's yes. coming out. That's the turning this group. They call themselves. Okay. Uh, 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 well, Jim, and then yeah. All right. come forward, Jim, so we can hear the question. Uh, smile, everyone. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get everything. Did, did you want to raise a question? Yes. Um, how much CO two comes from the undersea volcanoes? I read somewhere that uh, the you get more CO two from the uh, sub-ocean volcanoes than terrestrial volcanoes and what's the total amount of CO2 from those undersea volcanoes relative to uh, anthropogenic causes? Yeah, uh, I did study that topic but I, that's why I cannot answer that question. Um, I did not study this topic so that's why I cannot answer this question. 
but some of the Iceland eruptions are supposed to be major re emitters of CO2 based on published work. The ones off Iceland. And in terms of like percentage of anthropogenic? I don't know the answer. Right. You, you can calculate it because mid-ocean region yeah, has some chemistry on the deep ocean, the deep um, oceans is very, very uniform, including its volatile content, including its carbon dioxide content. And places like Iceland are sub-aerial exposures of mid-ocean regions, right? So the, the, uh, the gases in Iceland could be, you can extrapolate that to the other 47,000 kilometres of constantly active volcanism in the deep oceans and calculate the volume of CO2 being injected into the oceans by volcanism. Pair that to the amount being absorbed from human activity. Mm -hmm. You'll find so that there is a vast right. difference. Yes. So yeah, you have to talk. Right? Ah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good comment. Uh, thanks, Arthur. Well, on uh, on that happy note, uh, if you'd be good enough to put your hands together, uh, thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you for, for joining us this evening. Most interesting. Uh, thoroughly appreciated your your joining us.